Um, my name is Hannah. I am the Western Massachusetts Regenerative uh, Food System Coordinator with NOFA Mass. And today you are at um, Worker Co-op Farm Startup and Conversion with Olum Pixan, Matt Feinstein, Ziomara Parino, and Jose Martinez. Um, and sorry, my screen is just like all oh, finagled. Alum is a clan mother and indigenous mixed woman with Nofa Mass. She'll be presenting today. Matt um, is a co op clinic program manager with the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives and director of Global Village Farms, along with Alum. Zio Mara Parina is a worker co owner at the Access Co-op and board member at the Global Village Farms. And Jose Martinez is a member owner of Riqueres del Campo. Thanks for being with us all today, everybody. A few things before we get started. Um, we are presenting today from um, indigenous land. And we wanna take a moment to appreciate and acknowledge this land that we're on, um, that we currently occupy. Uh, please take a moment to visit this website to see whose land um, you are on today. Um, and we also ask um, in the process of attending today that you consider um, and do your best to support BIPOC groups. Um, such as the Urban Farming Institute, Gardening the Community, African Alliance, and Native Rights American Fund. Um, a just food system is going to be the best when everybody is participating and supported. Um, and We'll make every effort, oops, I'm sorry, my, my slides are just really all over the place today. We will make every effort to answer questions um, you have answered during the workshop. I think we'll be saving them to the end because we have a couple presenters today. Um, but in the meantime, feel free to use the chat feature to comment or ask during the um, questions during the chat. We'll collect them and then pose them at the end of the session. Um, we will try to find, oh yeah, okay. And then uh, if you'd like to speak at the end, simply click the microphone icon at the bottom of your screen. And during the presentation, we ask that you mute yourself um, in order to avoid any echoing or background noise. You also have the option to save the chat. Um, to the right of the chat box, there's three dots with extra actions and you'll have the option to save chat and it will download to your computer. So lots of good information usually comes up in the chat and um, that's, that's a great way to keep information. These recordings will also be available. We take some time um, to recognize our uh, sponsors. I have a gold Spencer slide, but it doesn't seem to be here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Um, but these, these folks make it all happen. Um, we, we couldn't do this conference um, without our sponsors. So take a second to acknowledge and appreciate the people who um, were able to make this happen today. We also have an online auction available, lots of great stuff um, for you to check out. Again, it helps to support um, this conference and also get access to some really great products out there. And then we have our online marketplace. Um, so go ahead uh, and <laughs> so sorry. Go ahead um, to the nofasummerconference.org. Um, actually, all of our sponsors and everything like that are up there as well. Um, so again, you can check out what we have to offer um, and support the folks again who are making this this um, presentation available to you today. Um, and now I will pass it on over to our presenters of the day.
Sherry. I'm sorry, everybody. I am just having a really tough time with all of my controls today. Um, it says that my, I'm so sorry. It says that my screen sharing is paused. Oh, goodness. Here we go. Thank you for bearing with me. I cannot even believe the amount of buttons I had on top of my screen. So thank you so much. Um, and now to our presenters. All right, Buenos go ahead, Udo. Buenos dias a todos. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. I hope that everybody has has been able to switch to or selected. If you need instructions, will be in your chat. Um, I had to do that. Um, my name is Ulum Pixan. My name is Ulum Pixan. I work in two co-ops and two cooperatives. And I also work at NOFA as education director. I work at the Access Cooperative, where we have language justice, interpretation, translation, and strategic planning services for cooperatives. I also work as a farmer and owner and worker owner of Global Village Farms, Takaway Farm. Global Village is a nonprofit organization that helps educate to people who are interested in farming and health, health, food, and food justice. Global Village Way Farm is the farm where we teach how to take care of the earth, conservation, preservation, how to connect to the earth, our food, our health, and, and how to connect with people from in different indigenous groups and how to farm and, and grow traditional. We also learn about, and, and we bring people who know traditional, traditional methods from their own traditional planting methods from their own communities. I am here to present um, several of my co-op friends and members. Xiomara uh, Paulino is going to be talking about one of my comrades and she's going to talk about how um, to start co-ops how can you start a co-op business? Um, so, so that would be Juan um, saying, talking about that. And then Xiomara will be, will be speaking and then Jose. Going here to, and that's okay. So Matt Feinstein is is speaking, and um, this has been a process. So if you could put in the chat just a little bit about you know what brings you here, um, uh, who you are, where you're coming from, things like that, um, just so we know, you know who's here and and what kind of things we should tailor our are uh, talked to. Um, so those questions are in the chat. And I'm just gonna get started with some basics about co-ops. I work with the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives. 
um, which is the national federation that does policy work and technical assistance and peer support for worker cooperatives in the US. Um, <clears throat> and people may be familiar with um, consumer cooperatives, right? Those are common in, in grocery, you know, natural food stores and things like that, where people come together where they're con consumer power and, and start a cooperative that benefits the people buying from, from the business. <clears throat> so those folks are buying together, right? They're bringing their, their buying dollars together as consumers. There are also producer cooperatives where people are coming together to sell and market together. This is common in the agricultural arena, especially with larger farms and, and commercial ag. There's, there's a lot of uh, producer cooperatives Ocean Spray, for example, you know, all the cranberry growers come together and market under one brand. And um, so producer cooperatives are another common kind of cooperative. Uh, and then worker cooperatives, it's the folks who are working together um, that share the, the workplace um, and the workers are the member owners. Um, this today's uh, workshop will focus on worker cooperatives. There are also multi-stakeholder cooperatives, people cooperatives that have come together both for uh, consumer members and worker members, for example, um, that share, you know, have different seats on the board and that kind of thing, and share governance and and participation and profit sharing. Um, but we're going to be focusing on the worker cooperative model for for today. Um, so in a worker cooperative, you know, people come together because they believe in good work, fair pay, job security, and broader community. It, you know, it's important to have each of these components sometimes, you know, at some point in your cooperative. Um, and, uh, uh, but it, you know, some co-ops focus on one area more than the other, or it could be the main reason for them to, to start. Um, it's important to, uh, to think of these two components when you're thinking of worker cooperatives. The joint ownership, right, that, that includes financial benefit and financial participation, um, and democratic decision making, democratic control. Um, and so uh, worker co-ops have both of these components. Uh, employee stock ownership plans, ESOPs, uh, may have the joint ownership component, right? They're employee owned, but they're not necessarily democratic. They don't elect their board, you know, every member there of the ESOP doesn't elect their, their board, for example. They have a, a traditional uh, corporate structure in their management and decision-making, but they have joint ownership. Then there are some outfits that have democratic control, like nonprofits that can't be, um, that can't be jointly owned. They're, they're nonprofit organizations that are accountable to the public, you know, fundamentally, but they have democratic structures for decision making in, in the workplace. So, you know, all of those are part of this broader employee ownership and, and democratic workplace movement, um, but worker cooperatives have both of these components. So we'll be focusing on worker co-ops, but um, there's, there's great creative ways you can, you can do things in other formats too. Just briefly to go over the principles of cooperatives. Um, the voluntary and open membership doesn't mean you have to let anyone into your co-op, but, but it does mean that you can't discriminate um, who you know, is allowed to apply for co-op positions. You can make sure that they have good mission fit, that they can do the jobs, those kind of things. Um, but it is important to have that anti-oppression uh, mindset in hiring and in how you set up your membership track. Every employee in, in a co-op should have the ability to apply for, for ownership too, for a membership track um, without discrimination. Uh, democratic member control, we talked about that. People having major the say in major decisions that could be electing the board, that could be uh, consensus on, on many decisions. If you're a collective, you know, non-hierarchical format, um, you can use majority voting and, and basic governance is done by the members in worker cooperatives um, and in cooperatives in general. Um, member economic participation, every member in a co-op gives some sort of participation. It can be low or high, you, you can decide that, but there's participation. And then 
there's benefit too uh, in the profit sharing. In a worker cooperative, there's profit sharing and um, based on, on your patronage, how many hours you've worked in the cooperative, that's patronage for a worker co-op. Um, so it's shared risk and reward. Autonomy and independence, co-ops are, are independent of a, you know, they're not uh, a local chapter, to, you know, of a broader thing that's deciding all the, the major decisions, they have their autonomy. There can be federations, there can be franchises, there can be a lot of creative ways of networking cooperatives, but there's uh, essentially autonomy at the cooperative level. Um, education and training, it's an active thing in co-ops, right? To actively educate and train members. Um, and then principle six, sometimes you hear it as P6, uh, is about the cooperation among the cooperatives, right? Supporting other co-ops in your area, your region. Food co-ops are great at this in, in the Northeast um, for, through the neighboring food co-op association and other places. So. Um, and through value chains and supply chains too, right? Um, where do the textiles come from for our print shop? Do we think about getting those from a cooperative and, and so on? Uh, con concern for community means you, you have accountability to your broader community and that includes climate and environmental justice. Lo what does the movement look like? Sometimes we think of co-op and we think of the 70s white hippie cooperatives some of those are still going that that maybe have been a reality. The worker cooperative movement in the US looks very different. It is majority um, black indigenous people of color. Um, and it is led by uh, immigrants and um, long standing uh, black communities who have who have come together for economic um, participation and benefit of their communities. So it, it looks different there. There's a whole you know, diversity, and this is the racial breakdown of the, the worker cooperatives in, in the US right now. And they're quite distributed around uh, the US. There's somewhere between seven and 900 worker co-ops now. It's hard to get an exact number. We just finished a census, so we'll have some updated numbers soon. But um, we verified 465 in our last census a few years ago. Uh, our, our organization has over 300 members, for example. So it's a it's, it's small compared to other cooperative sectors, but it's growing and it's like deeply rooted in social justice movements. So um, yes, I am going a little fast for the interpreters, I apologize. Member councils, um, this is something we offer at the US Federation of Worker Co-ops. Um, so people come together, uh, and get support for their individual co-ops, co but they also can join these councils and work for broader uh, policy and advocacy. Um, they can get better statutes in their state. They can work on uh, allowing immigrant owned LLC cooperatives to have full benefits in their state, things like that. That's a, a current piece of legislation in Massachusetts right now is to, to allow LLC immigrant cooperatives to, to get access to anything that says cooperative or employee owned in, in the state. Racial and economic justice, Movimiento de Inmigrantes en Cooperativas, that's a immigrant led uh, council. And we have a great uh, active peer network of worker co-op farms. So there's enough of them in the US to have this active council uh, or network that get together with monthly calls um, with uh, uh, an active listserv and a Slack channel. Uh, and so if you join our federation, you get access, you know, full access to this. Uh, there are ways of participating too before you become a member. Um, but, uh, you know, just know that there's, there's a network of support out there working on these specific issues of worker co-ops and, and farms. I'm gonna touch briefly on conversions before I pass it off. Um, so what we talk, we're gonna be talking a lot about startups, right? You're starting a new farm and you're thinking about the worker cooperative model, but it is also a, a great um, thing to think about converting an existing farm into a worker cooperative, right? And so when we talk about conversions, we talk about this transition um, and this transformation can be quite a, an intense one, right? Going from the, the caterpillar into a cocoon, it can be a messy and natural and emergent process and then coming out as a beautiful butterfly, though often with with uh, you know real um, 
intention around equity issues and that transformation, a real preservation of, of your goals and legacy as original uh, farm owners, that kind of thing. So, you know, a lot of what we'll be talking about might belong in the startup arena, but it probably also, you know, uh, has to do with conversions too. And there are lots of different kinds of conversions. People, um, owners can, are looking at it uh, to, as a way to grow and share ownership and not necessarily have to be the boss of a, of a larger farm crew or um, a retiring owner is looking for a succession strategy. And if you're looking for a succession strategy, you know, look at these different options, right? So preserving legacy, right? Are you gonna keep the legacy of your, of your business going? Well, worker co-ops are good for that. But if you don't have a, a family member to sell it, you know, to, to pass on your business to, then worker co-ops can be a really good option instead of having to close down or sell off your business to who knows if they will keep, you know, the main parts of the legacy. Um, market value, you can get a good value. You actually do a valuation before you sell your farm, for example, so, um, or food business. It, you know, um, that's a, a good thing to do early on is, is to get a valuation. Um, and there are tax benefits. There's ways of rolling it, rolling over your, your tax implications when you sell to the, to the workers of your, um, your business. So that's a good thing. And then you don't have to fire the employees, obviously, if you're selling to those employees. Um, and just really quick, kind of the, the overview of the transition. What does it look like? You start learning, you know, and you explore your options. Um, and then you assess, you do a full, um, you know, uh, you look at what are the needs of, of the, the sellers, of the, of the buyers. Um, you start a committee called a buyout or exploratory committee, and you start practicing inclusive decision making. You get a valuation from a third party, um, and you get something in writing saying, yes, this is going forward. Um, and then you move to prepare, you get help with co-op developers, you get a CPA and a lawyer involved. Then you do a transaction that's kind of like buying a house, right? You sign off on the paperwork, you do the closing. Um, and then don't forget to get ongoing support. So those are kind of the steps of, of the transition. There's a great community out there to support the, these conversions. There's active uh, support organizations in, in every region of, of New England. Um, and, and nationally um, with great technical assistance providers, people that have grant funds to put into this work. Um, so it doesn't have to be an overly expensive thing. And it's a great option for, for anywhere between, you know, if you have three to, to, you know, 30 employees anywhere in there, there have been, you know, or even larger, there have been great examples of, of converting, so. Um, I will pass it off to Xiomara Paulino from Access Cooperative, um, who has started an awesome cooperative uh, doing language justice. Hi all, me pueden, can all of you uh, hear me out? Sounds good. Good, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so um, in my experience with uh, the co-ops, uh, I never thought I was gonna be part of a, of a co-op, to be honest with you. Um, it's, it's kind of difficult to put your mindset in a different way uh, in this world, maybe this country, I don't know, they put your mindset that you are a worker, you have no say, you go, you get paid, like they structure your mind to think like that. So I really never thought that I was gonna make this my business um, in a way, um, but I'm glad that I, I took the chance and I did it. Um, like Matt was saying, the education piece is huge, it's ongoing. It never stops, it's all the time. Um, always different ways to do things, um, different ways to get people and all that. So that, that piece is very important. And it's one that, that gets overwhelming sometimes, but it's exciting at the same time. Uh, so that piece, uh, but like I said, change your mindset from being uh, a worker 
just a mere worker with no say, no nothing, to being an owner and make decisions and those responsibilities, it, it, it could shake you up. Uh, but again, it, it's very exciting and good. Um, in my experience, um, some of the most difficult things have been that, that the mindset, but also to, to find people that align with your beliefs, with what you want. Um, and I'm gonna piggyback a lot on what Matt said because it is basically on what I on, on what is difficult sometimes. So the cores and the principles of what a co-op is is also what makes it difficult to be a co-op, uh, to be open to everybody that everybody can join and all that. Um, it sounds really good. It's amazing. It's an opportunity for everybody, but it also creates a lot of problems um, when many or everybody is is an owner uh, and you may not get along, they have different beliefs than you and all that, that can create tensions. Again, training, education, finding ways to reconcile, to, to alleviate the problems and the issues that, that arise is really good. So uh, finding um, people that can support you that can be with you, that can guide you, mentoring. Uh, we are very thankful in Access that we have Matt uh, and the, the Federation supporting us, that they help us whenever we have an issue and a problem. Um, as far as education as well, uh, with Matt, we have had a lot of information, education, preparing ourselves. Um, so again, those cores and those principles that, that the co has is also what makes it difficult? Um, uh, what else do I wanted to say? Uh, one of the things that I find fascinating is the many steps that over here, when you open a co-op, you have to do. It's not just, oh, I wanna open my own business and that's it. You know, there is a step to it. Uh, you have to, make a business plan. You have to uh, uh, find, you know, what is it that you wanna do and then find people that will do it with you. So that that is the process. And in the meantime, you may or may not be making um, a profit, which is the main purpose why you started your own business, your own co-op. You know, you wanna be your own boss. Uh, you wanna have a say on what you, on, on the decisions but you also wanna make a profit. And that at the beginning, you, you may not see it and you may not see it as you want to, you know? So that, that takes some time and takes some time um, getting used to. And maybe that's why um, getting people to, um, to join your co-op is so difficult. You at the beginning have a lot of people that come in and then they, they go. You will have those, those people that come and go, come and go and don't stay. Uh, and I think it could be because of that, because of um, the financial piece uh, that comes with it at the beginning. It, it does get better, it does get better, but it's a struggle. It is a struggle. So again, align yourself with people that can support you, can guide you, uh, that can, in a way, take your hands and tell you how to navigate all these things. It's really important um, and, and good. Um, I don't know what else to, to say. Uh, for us in Access has been, has been really good. Um, when we got together, uh, we started as a mere interpretation call. And at the beginning it was a little fun. You know, we were just thinking about making some money and things like that. But then as time progressed, we knew that we wanted to make something more. You know, not just um, make it about a business and things like that. So we started talking about language justice, education, uh, empowerment for women um, in, in communities of colors and, and, and things like that. So we are not just a, an interpreter and um, translation co-op. So it, it happens as well that you start with one idea and then it evolves to something else, to something more. And that happened to Access. I, I'm glad to say that right now we are 
I call that is workers own women. Uh, and we just don't work on language. We do advocacy, uh, training, um, empowerments, all, all, all those things. And I hope that we continue changing, you know, to better ourselves and to, um, and to be different. Um, again, it's a struggle. Uh, with the pandemic, we didn't make much. I think we didn't do anything. Uh, but because, it, because it's something that we believe in, it's something that we wanna do, we continue. So we passed through the pandemic and things are picking up now. Uh, so those of you that have a call, but that you don't see uh, any profits that it might be difficult for you to, to obtain people to come into your dream and you know to bite into that, just hang in there. It, it will happen. The struggle will never leave, but the rewards will always be there. Even if they are small, they, they will be there. So um, I'm, I'm very happy with what we do, where we are and where we have gone. Um, there's, a, there's a language issue with Audi. Um, if you can click on the globe, si puede uh, poner el globo abajo en su pantalla y escoger su idioma, choose the globe and... Um, and Siomara, I have a slide up about the Co-op Academy and one about Common Bound, if you wanna continue and, and share anything about those. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of education, like I said, it, it never stops. Um, one thing, because at the beginning, I, I kind of have an idea what it entails to have an old business and things like that. But, you know, this is a different country. I'm from the Dominican Republic. Things are different. And I didn't know exactly what a co op was. So the first step was to engage into the co op academy. I kind of did it twice. And it helped a lot, to be honest with you. This is a lot of information. Everything was new to me. Uh, and it was really good. Uh, so the co op academy is a couple of weeks. And uh, you also get to know and see other people that are from other co-ops as well. So you get to see um, different um, dreams, ideas, and things like that. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a good way to, to kind of uh, mingle and, and get o o other people and see what they're doing. But it teaches you a lot. It, it touches on, on the principles, on, on budgeting, making your plan, your business plan, because you do have to have a business plan, especially if you want sponsors or, or you are going to be um, doing grants and things like that. Uh, it touches on resources out there, um, how to get into the community. So it's, it's, it's a lot of information condensed and all, but you also have mentors. Uh, the teachers are, are your mentors that, that will guide you. And I'm happy to say that those teachers are not only there just for the co-op academy time frame, six, eight, nine weeks, whatever it is, they are there for life. I mean, Matt was ours uh, and he's still here. You know what I mean? So they, they continue with you as long as you want them, as long as you need them, they will always be with you. So that, that has been good. Like I said, I did it twice and I don't regret it and I didn't, do it twice because I was a bad student, which is a lot of information. <laughs> um, one of uh, the common bound, as uh, Matt said, it was a huge job that we did in, in New York as a, a small cop uh, interpreters that, that we did. Uh, and not only in New York, we did also conferences. It was a huge conference in New York and also here in, in, in Rhode Island. And I think there were more than more than 500 people, right? A lot more than that, more than 1,000 people. Um, and we were able to obtain that, that, that um, gig, as they call it, that job. And um, we met people in Common Bound. There were people all over the world, uh, many, many different languages um, that they all came together. Um, and we were uh, interpreting. It felt really good, <laughs> really important. Uh, it was like interpreting for the United Nations uh, <laughs> type of thing over there. But uh, 
but we were able, a, a small local co-op was able to obtain uh, that, you know, that business at the, at the common brand, ground in common bound and, um, and, and just be there in, in working and in representing all of us. It was a huge experience. It was difficult to coordinate it and put it together. Uh, it took a lot of work, but we were able to, to put it together. Thank you, Siamara. Um, next, we have Jose from Riquezas del Campo. So if you have not chosen your language and you need interpretation into English, make sure you click the globe icon and choose English. Uh, and Jose, take it away. Sí, hola, buenas tardes a todos. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning. <laughs> everybody okay? It's a pleasure to be here with you all. I am learning and sharing ideas. Yeah, interpretation is ready. It's ongoing. Yes. Okay. It's a pleasure um, being with you it's today. It's beautiful to be here today. Um, I received an invitation to share my experiences from the field from uh, the farm. The experience that I have in a cooperative farm is it's very pretty new. new. Uh, and it's, it's an advantage, advantage in a certain I, way. All right. Excuse me. There are two interpreters, English interpreters, speaking right now. I think at the same time. Okay. So, um, okay. I I will stop then. ¿Están escuchando todos? Sí. Bueno. Eh, bueno, eh, como, como les comentaba, eh, bueno, la experiencia que tengo con Riquezas del Campo, eh, una finca cooperativa. The experience I have with Riquezas del Campo is a very new. So I see this is an, an advantage. Um, we have a lot of experiences very recent to the end of 2020. I became, we are right now five uh, co-op members, worker owners. As Xiomara was saying, to be part of a co-op, a worker-owned business, to be a worker-owned, it might be somebody that can't hear me. If you're a worker owner of your own business, something that I have never imagined. After being 20 years of working, has, you know, sometimes um, people would say to me um, that I wasn't worth anything or I felt that way at work. And because of the Campo, I'm in a campaign that is helping um, farms in Massachusetts. 
was in that time that I started to um, work with some members of my worker uh, center. And the worker center started to do a proposal as part of uh, conservation. And it was to try to rescue some lands that nobody was working. And basically that was the beginning of So, the Riqueza del Campo was a pilot proposal, and they have helped us a lot through the process of creating our uh, workaround um, farm, and they have given us all the tools and help needed for us to be um, working and have success. We have been started a very hard working process. It's a lot of us started a process uh, and we have a big a uh, project of, of change of infrastructure or creation of infrastructure. And one of the things that I think is a challenge for us to be working is that all the worker owners in the Quesa de Campo have a full-time job someplace else. So we have to give an extra push to the labor of So it gives us, it makes us have an extra push and extra effort to make it work because it's a challenge for us to be able to make it because sometimes when you're working for someone, you just do what they tell you to do. You obey the orders. But when you're making the decisions um, on your own work, it's a different option for work. You have to learn a lot of things that you don't get taught in other places. And it's a challenge because you have to fight stronger because it's, you also have to be conscious that it's other people, their owners, especially the diversity of ideas especially because you have to be conscious that it's other perspectives of your co-workers and it's a, it's a continuous uh, learning process and ha you have to have your brain and your heart open to be able to keep learning and here we have a big diversity of members, uh, worker owners. We have people of color, we have white folks. I think that help us to um, take advantage uh, everybody's capacities and skills to the fullest. And one of the most important pieces of be a co-op is that we are in partnership or sisterhood with uh, the worker center and they really help us 
to um, keep us up in a continuous wear way. During the weekends, they're there and supporting us. During the week, they also do that. In this way, we have a lot of, we're lucky that we have a lot of help, especially um, organizations like NOFA that are trying now to really help us and be in support of our program. In the little well, time that I have at Riquezas del Campo, um, since the end of 2020, I have learned a lot of things um, different than the last 10 years uh, I have been in the United States. Especially because this business is in a, a straight opposition to capitalism it's very hard to imagine that this exists. Also, especially, um, I feel like um, at the beginning, we were trying to just work for free to the um, city of Northampton, as you see here. We were working this with um, very um, small tools and with volunteers in a very rudimentary way. So we didn't have the vision to have a co-op because we wanted to plant any other vegetables. Especially um, because we didn't have access to work the land. It will, we would like to have a good communication as, as people. I want to say thank you to all the volunteers and all the people that have worked in one way or another. Especially because um, there's a lot of cooperatives, especially um, because a lot of people that are part of the Worker Valley Center. They have helped us to uh, distribute all, also our products. Because we don't have an organic certification, but we still can sell our products as a, a natural products um, at good price. Because we're really taking care of the soil and we are trying to be very conscious about what we pour or add to the soil so we could have very good um, so you can see here how the volunteers are helping us to disinfect and wash our water containers because we do not have water all the time there. And um, this is the way we fight against um, dry season. And actually, uh, this is what it shows um, that we try and 
So this year uh, we had access to 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 have a little bit of more funds. We have ways uh, now to protect our vegetables. We can use um, plastic uh, tunnels like um, caterpillar tunnels too. So um, it had helped us to keep to keep uh, the weeds down because it, it, it was a lot of extra work because we have to keep the the weeds down and it was a, a lot of extra work. But now you can see that we are learning and teaching the new uh, generation and they now know how to plant little plants and how to take care of them. So I think this is uh, an opportunity because a lot of our children don't have the knowledge um, of how to do this. So this is an important thing for us. Thank you, Jose, Jose for a very good example. We're gonna open it to questions, especially to members. Feel free to put any questions in the chat <coughs> or unmute yourself and ask questions, especially of the member owners we have here. Muchas gracias, Jose. Um, me llamo Elisa, vivo en Turner's Falls. Me llamo Elisa, vivo en Turner's Falls. And here we, we also started a farm. I want to eat some in El Rio. Here. Uh, it's uh, an island in the Connecticut side. And I imagine that, that your farm has um, people of different cultures. It's, it's the same in my very many, many people of different cultures. I am, I am curious. To know about have you have any any problem in the field um, in the in the farm of any like different cultures you know having different cultures any problems that you had uh, with other people because of this what did you do with that I will tell you that that people. Um, there is, there is a stereotype in general, very, very big, that, that sometimes, that sometimes it doesn't let you uh, to even, to even say hi to, 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 to even to your neighbor, uh, that sometimes that that stereotype doesn't let you to, to get to know other people, the people of color, you know? There are many people quiet in, in our farm, you know. I will say that maybe custom uh, is hard for them to, to integrate, to talk to other people of different cultures. Uh, and, and besides working or, or volunteering or whatever, is is the is a way of living. You you are cohabitating with other people. I, who, who what I have seen, the people that go there, the different people, they, they enjoy uh, the place, they enjoy the living. I think that each and every one, they, they integrate to, to the other cultures, to the other people at their own time when they feel ready. They, 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 you know, at their own time, they let us meet them, they let us meet them, and, and then they, 
they let themselves meet us, you know? I understand. It's interesting. Here, my neighborhood is, is made. We have white, black, Latino. But we don't have a lot of immigrants. It's, it's, a, lived, it's a different situation, you know? We are not united. We just, we, we just live. Um, among each other, around each other, but, but thank you. Thank you for, for your words. We have another question. Um, for all co-op owner members, what are some of the opportunities or aspirations you are looking forward to, uh, to as your farm and practices develop? Para todos los miembros de la cooperativa, ¿Cuáles son algunas de las oportunidades? He's repeating the same question in English. Están esperando o deseando al ver que la finca y las prácticas agrícolas se van desarrollando. Creo que esta pregunta está dirigida también al, al compañero José. I can respond. Yo puedo responder primero y después le doy tiempo a José. I can respond uh, first and then I will let José know. Uh, las aspiraciones cambian, creo. Aspirations they change. Like you had said before, when we started first, we just wanted to, to make some money in our community, you know, and our job was just interpretation. And we just wanted to serve the, the community. And then that's, that was at that moment. And then little by little, our uh, aspiration team, we, we, we noticed that our, our aspirations, what we wanted, we saw that it was good for the community, but, but it was also good for us to, to grow, to help ourselves as well, to, to we have different ways to relate to, to one another and even in our uh, job. And we also have an opportunity to at one point leave behind our regular jobs and make this uh, 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 our primary job and, and have more time to, to raise our kids, be with, be with our families. And, and to, to learn all the things that maybe we wouldn't be able to do if we were in a, a regular business job. And, and it is a lot of work because almost always when you start a co-op, you start without having clients, with having, without having any structure. Or, or have, or even having the knowledge of what you're gonna do, uh, or, or especially having a, a, for instance, accounting uh, knowledge um, about the market, again, accounting, uh, how to sell. Those most than, most than anything is the most difficult part. Um, we saw a lot, a lot of opportunities to, to grow. And, and you, can, you can make it a, a, a job, um, your full-time job. Uh, maybe within three to five years, you can, you can make it. This is a very extensive question. For us, it's our third year. We, we have a lot of challenges. Uh, even though we're new, but we, we have a lot of challenges. 
the, the most the, the big challenge that we have now is to have a, a, a strong base, you know. We, we want the people that, that come to our farm We, we want the people that come to our farm to have a, a better picture of what it is. Because we we now, the, the new members that are here, we are working on the on, on the on the business plans and we are working on, on everything. We started the sale, the selling. We are working. We are working on our our priorities, and of course, one of them is to have more workers, donors to join us, or members. For this year, we have in our priorities in our priorities uh, to 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 have more training. For our for our members, so they can grow and, and educate themselves as much as they can. Um, also, priorities on communication. We 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 hope that we in the future um, uh, that that we get better in in, in educate ourselves better on education, you know, we have people of different cultures, different beliefs. So we need that because sometimes, sometimes we have um, some disagreement, something. And, and, and before when we were uh, staff, just workers, maybe that wasn't important, but it is important now. But definitely, One of the challenges, uh, um, one of the challenges is the planning, the, the, the planning or the business plan. Um, it will be a, a big mission, a big thing to be part of a, a, of a club where you are the owner. I think it is. I would like to make a question if I could. Jose, Ulu, they talk about love for the land. Generally, this happens when you, when we. Ese amor por la tierra se construye cuando tú ves tu milpa, tu chakra. Usually, that love for the land happens when you. When you are Milpa, when when you have a land and you can kind of do your own farming, here land is different. Uh, even the love for the land is a little different. You know, like uh, it, sometimes you have to you know the land from from scratch. How was that process for you to? Uh, with, with, even with the, the climate, so different from here and, and from where you came from, how was that process to love this land? Well, I'm going to answer. I think that when somebody loves the land, I think that you transfer that love wherever you go. You take it with you. I know that the lands are different, climates are different, but but when there's the necessity, when there's a need, or when there's something that motivates you, 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 you make 
you make do the circumstances don't matter you make do since i remember that since i was a kid i, I remember just loving the land farming i come from I come from a, a place where the majority of people are, are peasants. They, they are farmers. And, and I remember that there was a time that they all organized each other to be the owners of the land. Um, and those were the, the Zapata land. I, I, I was born and raised over there and I started working among them. I started working among the vegetables. And I think I think that unfortunately there are people that haven't had the, 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 the opportunity to have my experience, you know, to live this. But, but definitely when, when, when there are people that don't have the land to farm, it's different. For instance, in the case of the campo, we have a community garden, and, and there's white people. Uh, they, they live in apartments, you know, and then they come and they farm. They, 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 they do their own vegetables. You know, they learn. I think the love is there. Definitely, definitely. Gracias. Thank you. Ulum, do you want to say something? Sí. Okay. Hola, me escucha? Hay un eco. There's an echo. Sí. Um, Agregando el comentario que tienen sobre la cooperativa. Apágalo, apágalo. ¿Y ahora? Todavía sí. Ahora sí. Ok. Ahora. Uh, hablando sobre las cooperativas y las experiencias, eh, no solo pequeñas y grandes, por ejemplo, yo soy parte de una cooperativa. Y, y bien grande y me siento uh, completamente a veces perdida y no puedo decir, oh, soy dueña. Entonces, esas son experiencias que uno va viviendo. Yo la estoy viviendo ahora mismo y es, a veces me siento como, wow, ¿cómo digo que soy parte de esto cuando hay otras cosas que están pasando? Pero eso me ha dado a entender de cómo uno puede ir aprendiendo y haciendo pequeños, uh, pequeños grupos different processes. Somebody else would like to share something? Yo quería uh, hablar de eso que Jania trajo. I would like to talk about that that Jania talked. Her point was subir la escala de miembros que se pierde un poco la estructura. Like when when there, when it is a big uh, fall, right? That you lose a little bit of uh, of of ownership, like there are some members that earn more than others. And some others have more decision power. Oh. And the democracy. The democracy inside the workplace in these co-ops, and I think most of the times it's just uh, a push for the uh, capitalism La to continue. De, and, and it's the colonial culture that makes 
this happen. Maybe something this will be a, a good uh, point, study point of conversation to have at one point, maybe in another conference. We need to always um, be aware that there are places that have those dynamics, that um, power dynamics within court. And, and you, you have to have a plan for when conflicts arise. That's a great transition into what we wanted to share next, um, which for some best practices in starting a cooperative or converting into a cooperative. So I will share some more slides about that. But this just wanted to reflect that this has been a, a really rich conversation, really rooted in, in practice and, um, and, and deep experience. So thank you for all the participants. Um, but thinking about startup work areas, right? You have your, your core team, maybe three to seven, 10 people that you're ready to start this cooperative with, ideally. And you, then you can think, okay, where are people strong? And what, what are some work areas we can divide these into? And these are three that we you know, kind of um, have seen as, as good practices. Um, First is the co-op capacity. That's thinking about how uh, the work supports the function, you know, how, how you do your internal work, right? Who is on the team? How do you create, how do you go from one or two people's, uh, you know, individual visions into a shared vision? Um, who, uh, who gets to do what work? How do you delegate that work? How do you hold each other accountable? All this stuff that we just started to scratch the surface on. Um, and there are some best practices that, you know, we can share with you templates for meeting uh, agendas. And, you know, it's important to, to have some systems in place. So let's give an example of uh, Llama Pepper Farm. You know, they started because they were excited about growing their peppers and they loved their llamas that would run all over the farm. Um, and but they didn't have very clear roles. And then so they had people dropping important tasks due to these unclear systems. And, you know, they're growing some good peppers, but it was in their meetings. It was kind of a mess. And a lot of the marketing and stuff wasn't getting done. So then they decided they needed to take a little pause. They kept growing some peppers, feeding their llamas, of course but they're really focused on their systems of accountability. So what did they do? They put into place some work plans. Every person was clear on what their job, uh, job description was, their work plan was, when they needed to do things by. They set up a system of evaluations, peer evaluations, so that they would give each other feedback. Um, and then they set up task lists at these meetings. So what is the specific task? Who is going to do it and by when? And you know, if those tasks weren't being done, it wasn't about shaming people in the meeting. It was about getting to underneath. Why are those tasks not getting done? What more information does that person need? What more support does that person need? Um, and so they, but then, you know, they also for the long run, they said, oh, we probably need a grievance system. So if there's harm done in the co-op, we know how to deal with it and maybe remove a, a, a member if, if needed. We need to know how to deal with suspension and removal. Um, we also want a system of mentorship for new members. Um, so they set up all those systems and they grew some great peppers and had fantastic meetings and their llamas were really happy and spat all over them. Um, then the second area that we uh, think about is business development. This is someone who's good at the spreadsheets, right? They, they might be able, and they're really thinking about creating value for customers. You can have a great organization, grow some great vegetables, but if you're not uh, creating value and really have a strong revenue source, then sustainability is gonna be really hard. So, you know, what are you doing that is more effective, higher quality, more convenient, you know, run your, 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 business plan, an agile business plan. You could do a business model canvas. These are tools to do mini business plans um, so that you can really understand who are your customers, 
who are your producers, who are your suppliers, how does that connect and how do you create value in that, in that chain? Um, and then this person might be also thinking about the right legal form. Um, Massachusetts, Vermont, Rhode Island now have great worker co-op statutes, uh, but maybe LLCs are a better system, a better uh, setup for your cooperative, limited liability companies. Um, you want to talk to tax professionals about, you know, how you're going to be paying uh, taxes in, in your cooperative. Uh, there are some great advantages uh, for, uh, for all being uh, owners of the cooperative from the very beginning, especially for immigrant cooperatives. So if you have interest or, or questions about that, feel free to reach out to any of the presenters today to talk about that. Um, this person will also be thinking about raising startup capital. Here in New England, we're lucky to have the Cooperative Fund in New England that specifically funds cooperatives. They, have a, they even have a loan for before you're, you're in production uh, so that you can, you can build up your business plan and be compensating yourselves in, in the meantime, uh, a launch loan. There are other sources of capital. Uh, you can team up with a nonprofit to get grants, that kind of thing. So, you know, think about uh, raising capital and then the management structure. Are you going to have sort of this, this management structure where the members elect a board and the board hires a manager and the manager oversees the, the worker owners, kind of this cyc cyclical governance and management structure? Or are you gonna have a, a more creative one with committees that you know, are really empowered to do a lot of the work? Are you gonna have a collective structure where you all make uh, decisions together. Um, so think that person will be thinking about your structure. Um, get connections to a, a lawyer about your legal entity, but, but don't do that right away. First, it's recommended that you talk about a lot of the questions with your, your core group. Uh, how are people going to become members? How are you going to make decisions? Is it by consensus? Is it you strive for consensus and then you have a fallback to a vote? Are you just going to vote? Um, is there a, what is the cost to, to join the cooperative and, and how do you, where are you going to set that? How do you want profits to be divided? Um, will you need outside investors? That's a big one. Um, you know, Wellspring Spring Cooperative uh, in Springfield, for example, for their a uh, large commercial greenhouse needed to do a direct public offering. So their corporate structure, you know, uh, they decided, you know, they needed a certain type of corporate structure to allow those kind of outside investors. Um, but maybe you're starting with the capital from inside and that's not necessary. So decide some of those capital questions too, then go to a lawyer and have them help you find the right kind of um, entity and then work on your governance with a co-op developer. Um, there are a lot of different groups in the, in the Northeast that can help you. Cooperative Development Institute has a lot of experience with farms. Um, the US Federation, we have a co-op clinic where we can pair you up with someone else in the, agri in the food industry um, that is also a trained advisor. And if you're in a rural area, we have funds to subsidize that work. So reach out and find that assistance, which is the part of this third work area, is building that ecosystem. Where can you get that technical assistance? Um, technical assistance is support in your business plan, in your financial projections, in your governance, in setting up your bookkeeping, in, um, in, in lots of areas like that, in your business systems too. So, um, and there are small business supports that are not necessarily cooperative specific. Uh, small business development centers, SBDCs exist in a lot of places. So, so get, get the support. Don't try to do it in isolation. Connect to other cooperatives. Connect to other social movements. There are farm worker alliances. There are, you know, NOFA has a lot of great sources. So be well connected. Um, and then this person will also be thinking about customer commitments, right? and where government can support. So just to leave you with a few online resources, um, Sustainable Economies Law Center at cooplaw.org has a lot of great legal stuff. Um, our sister organization at the national level, 
um, has a lot of great resources at institute.coop, that's DAWI. And then we're the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives, we have a lot of resources as well. And like I mentioned, we have a co-op clinic where you can connect and get that technical assistance. Um, and um, another way to connect into the broader co-op movement, uh, this fall, November 3rd through 5th, there'll be worker co-op convenings. Um, and the Eastern Conference for Workplace Democracy will have some great sessions for worker co-ops uh, and you can sign up at conference.coop. And we run a longer version of this uh, every month, sometimes in English, sometimes in Spanish. The dates uh, are up there on the left. So if there are folks in your, your team that would benefit from participating in one of these kind of webinars, feel free to, to share that information. So we have a couple minutes for very, yeah, this info will be emailed out. I believe you'll have access to these slides. Um, I can, I can paste a link in the chat when we stop in a second. Um, and if there, um, if there are any burning questions, we just have a little bit of time uh, and then we will wrap up. So yeah, feel free to post them in the chat or, or unmute yourself with, with, with questions. Any questions, anybody? This is our time. Okay, I'll go ahead and wrap us up. So uh, Juan was able to give us a couple of links um, for our departure. Again, thank you so much, everybody. This has been really informative. I've loved hearing everybody's experiences. The stuff that really helps us go a long way. So, um, what is it? You want to go fast, go alone. You want to uh, go strong, go together. So, we have the survey. Um, please, we appreciate your feedback. We read every one. Um, this helps us organize our conferences better. Um, thank you for your patience in the beginning with all the technical difficulties. Um, sorry about that, my buttons disappeared, but we're here now, so it's great. Um, we also have the vendor marketplace again. Um, so you can even find some discounts um, if you go to the um, program manual and um, lots of really great stuff on there, including the conference t-shirts. We also have our auction again. Um, so yeah, please check that out. It will be there's some really good stuff in there. I think like some compost and some coffee. And then um, we also have our continuing ed option. Um, attendance at the NOFA summer conference fulfills all four continuing ed education hours for AOL CPs. So if you keep a record of your attendance and submit it at the next, um, uh, Re-accreditation cycle, um, you can get credits for uh, attending the conference. And of course, uh, we have more workshops this weekend and all week long. So the program book will be updated routinely just in case things change each day. So make sure you're refreshing that. Um, and the link for the rest of the programs is in the chat as well. And thank you, everybody. Again, you'll find these links when the recording goes up. And um, it's been a pleasure. Our presenters, gracias. And thanks to the interpreters and the, and the presenters interpreter. slash interpreters. Yeah. That's right. Very good. So thank you. OK. Adios, everybody. Adios.